here. I am Dean Tribble. I am CEO of Agoric and one of the technical founders. And I'm going to talk about orchestration and, and really about uh, enabling a whole, uh, you know, a, a much richer future of um, things that are currently impossible for people to build. And I'll, I'll talk about how that is, how that works, and so forth. Agoric is a layer one chain using uh, Comet BFT, like many things, including, I think, Polygon, right? Um, for primarily doing orchestration and solving really the chain abstraction problem. And I'll talk a lot about how that happens, how that works, and how we achieve it, and how that helps all of the end user use cases in getting out there to, to the much larger masses by solving the real problems that they have. Now, we started the chain abstraction drumbeat in February of this year, along with, uh, with Near, uh, with Flashbots, and so forth, at ETH Denver. Really getting the idea of chain abstraction out there as a thing where users want to be able to use underlying assets and services without caring about the underlying tribe or the underlying chain. And our solution and our approach was this thing, which I'll be describing, called orchestration, that has since turned into an entire category. And you'll see other people now talking about orchestration, where that's a big part of being able to, to provide the next generation of rich use cases that are currently impossible on these systems, and so that's, that ball is now rolling, it's now taken off, and everyone knows that what we need to do in order to deliver real value to users, to the much larger class of end users out there, is to do these things that a year ago were basically impossible and people were not really thinking very hard about how to accomplish. So, so that, that was the, the orchestration thing, and that ball is now rolling. So, where did we start, right? We've got these interoperability things, but it's really in the form of connectivity. We've got an explosion of chains, an explosion of L2s. We've got the modular and data availability stuff. So you've got the Celestias and the Sagas and the, and the Avail and the Eigenlayer, and, you know, data availability layers, all those kinds of things, where you're going to have an increasing number of connected chains, but they are isolated, right? You've got these connections, but you have to hand carry your assets from one place to another. And the thing is, users don't want to do that. So people have started with these abstraction things to make that easier, whether it's across or skip go, where I can say, I have this asset over here, I need that, that asset over there, make it happen, right? And make it easy. And they've got these much better, much prettier use cases and much prettier tools. And it looks like a lot of progress. But, OK, so I've got a couple questions for the audience. So first off, a quick digression. Who here has an engineering background? Technical background, programmer, that sort of thing. So we've got, it, we've got about half and half. Right? And then how many people have used some of these tools where you can move money around with this helper tool that will do the swaps or do the transfer between chains to go from one ETH to another, right? Or to ETH to, 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 to Solana or something like that. Okay, so about half. The thing about this is I would imagine when you bought your plane ticket to come out here, you used what I will refer to as a travel abstraction site where you could say, I want to I travel. My bet is when you bought the plane ticket, you did not have to move money from one bank to another and make sure it converted into the local currency of the airline in order to buy your plane ticket, right? I would bet that you pretty much pushed a button, swiped a credit card, and got the plane ticket, right? That's the typical experience, and that's what we expect when you actually talk about what's the end user use case, right? Users don't actually want to just move money around. They want to do something with the money. That's why they're here. They want to buy the NFT. They want to invest in a yield fund. They want to get their money out and go buy a house. Whatever it is, they do this motion. They do these things in order to do something with the money, and that is surprisingly difficult with crypto. You end up having to move the money and then do the next thing, right? Okay, and so what we want is to have not just the ability to move money around or do these point solutions that abstract away a little bit of the underlying infrastructure. We want to do the things that are currently impossible and just say, you know what, I've got an end-to-end -end use case. It's going to take 20 minutes or 20 days. That's what I want support with, not some instantaneous trade. Okay, now part of the reason why this is so hard is our systems are currently designed where your code and your programs and your smart contracts all start and end within one block, right? You've got five seconds or one second or whatever it is to do your smart contract behavior, and that means you can do a swap. 
but you sure can't buy a ticket. You can't have an operating subscription. You can't do a daily yield return and take yield from a fund and go buy some. Okay. So that's what people want to do is these longer term multi-block actions. And this is where orchestration comes in. So chain abstraction is the first thing that users want. What they really want is they want these rich, longer use cases. They want an interaction that starts and ends with their desire and they get what they want, not a five second block. And so that's what we support directly, and we support it directly in a way that can talk to and control other chains. And so the orchestration is about not a particular chain, but it's about being able to build rich use cases that span multiple chains, ecosystems, tokens, et cetera. Okay. So what are some examples, right? An on-chain liquidity solver, and I'll go into some of these in a little more detail later, but you've heard of solvers you've seen across where I can say, I want this thing, an intent system. I have this token here, I want that token here, some market maker steps up, gives it to me, and then they get a reward at the end for making that happen. That's really nice, but it's really off-chain, and if I wanted off-chain, I'd go to TradFi, right? Being able to have all of this done in a smart contract running on chain with assets executing a strategy, that's where people would like to be able to get to that will give us a richer next generation economy and that's something that we'd like to be able to build, right? You've got in place swaps of Bitcoin. You don't want to bring Bitcoin over from, from Bitcoin into some blockchain, you want to be able to trade it in place. So you want to be able to do swaps that are cross chain or cross ecosystem where I will give you this NFT here or this payment over here if you transfer Bitcoin over there. So you've got multi-chain, multi-ecosystem escrow enabling us to do much more commerce than we can currently do in these systems where you bring everything into one place, everything into one chain before you can do anything at all. And so having these spread out commerce is really valuable. Multi-chain gaming systems. And there's a lot of these kinds of things where, you know, like ticketing. I really like ticketing. Ticketing is an $80 billion a year industry, right? $80 billion in revenue a year. And we're barely scratching the surface of crypto because we can move the money, but all these systems, it's impossible for them to move the money and then buy the ticket. Right? Or to take it where I've got Soul and I want to buy that ticket over in Cosmos, or I've got ETH and I want to buy that ticket on Polygon, and I can't just push a button and have that multi-chain, multi-turn activity happen. I've got to manually step through it, and let me tell you, I'm just not going to do that much work for the local you know, performance uh, ticket. Right? Whoops, uh, I just hit the wrong button. There we go. Um, so subscriptions you can't do because you can't do stuff with time, all those kinds of things. So I'm going to dig in to how this works using uh, an element from yield optimization. Okay? So I've got, uh, I, I've got uh, USDC on Arbitrum, and I want to put it into compound on uh, Polygon, let's say, um, and then take the daily yield and build up an ETH position. That, that, that's what I want to do, right? That's what, that's what I was told I should do. I want to set that up, I want to authorize it, and I want it to happen, right? How do we do that? Right? So the way, the way orchestration works, I get to sign one transaction that says, here, go do this thing, and then a smart contract is going to do it, where that smart contract in this architecture runs on Agoric, written in JavaScript, I'll show you that, where Agoric then can reach out over various bridges, technologies, et cetera, to the chain, so it reaches out to Arbitrum, moves my money to Polygon, sets it up in Compound, and then every day wakes up and takes it from Compound, takes the yield and puts it over on ETH. Right? So what does that look like? Because I can describe that in one slide, but if I was to try and do that in Solidity, oh my God, it'd be hundreds of lines of code if I could get it right at all. So what does that look like? In, the, in this orchestration model, it looks like JavaScript. So millions of programmers, what is it, 17 million programmers know, would know how to program this stuff? So let me just take this for granted, right? I've got an account, I've got money on, on, on Arbitrum, and I've got this constant, which is the amount I'm depositing, just so we don't have to deal with that, right? But, I start by, in the orchestration API, get an object that says, what are all the things that from orchestration I could do on Polygon, right? I could, for example, make an account, right? So I'm gonna make a brand new account that is, that, that is controlled by this user, and you see the first miracle of the platform here, which is I can wait for that to happen. So this goes over Axelar, it goes over Union Bridge, it goes over whatever the technology is that gets us from one chain off to Polygon and creates an account there. And now I've got an account that's controlled by this smart contract, and I can sit there and I can wait for that to happen. So this is a multi-block action 
This didn't all happen in five seconds. It had to reach out and do some, engage in some in communication. And when that comes back, we have the second miracle of the platform. So just sit there and wait for that to happen. This can be happening for thousands of people at a time. The answer comes back, and we have the second miracle, which is user account is a JavaScript object that is the only thing on the planet that can control that brand new account that I just made on Polygon. Okay? So now it's under control of this smart contract, so it can do stuff for me. And I don't have to worry about the funky security model and all the various stuff that's going on. Nope, I just got this object. I understand it. I understand how to use it. And so now I'm going to say, okay, take my USDC and transfer it over to that, transfer the deposit amount, transfer the $1,000 over to that user account over on Polygon. And you know, here it's nice and abstract. From a business logic point of view, you understand I wanted to transfer. Configuration-wise, I might have set up various options. The obvious one being, it's, it's USDC. I want to use that with CCTP, right? That will transfer with a nice uh, protocol that is reliable, determined, can handle any amount of money, doesn't have any liquidity concerns, and the money will get there. All I can do is transfer USDC, but it's really nice for that particular purpose. And then I will reach out, once that's finished, the USDC is there, I now know it's there, I will, you know, the program, the contract will reach out, um, get the, from that app chain, get the object which, which knows about the contract details for Compound, and say, okay, supply it with my money. Right, so it's now going to that brand new account that I created that got the thousand bucks in it, and saying supply it into Compound. So now Compound is gonna start earning yield on my behalf using that money. And that was something that, you know, could be the click of the button on a website, but it's now doing an operation that takes three or four chains, right? Okay, now what if I want to go on to the next step, right? Um, oh, you want to take a picture, go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, I've got, you know, I now want to take that interest, right? So every, so what I want to do is everything over the deposit amount, well, that's the interest, right? That's the way compound works. Let me get that, whoop, let me get that, push the right button. Let me get that interest out. If it's zero, of course, don't bother doing anything. This is just JavaScript, right? I can return, I can throw exceptions, I can do all that sort of stuff, right? Um, uh, and get the Uniswap contract and say, okay, swap that interest for ETH on the Uniswap contract, right? And uh, transfer that over to Ethereum into a, an account that the user provided, which is their cold storage account. Right, that was the use case I had here, is take the yield, put it into a cold storage. This is now an account that I no longer have control over. It's now you know, controlled by their ledger off-chain and all this sort of thing. And I made that happen. It's a few lines of code to have arranged that where the user could have approved both of these. Do the, you know, deploy the yield and then redeem it and go build up the, the, the cold storage account. Well, obviously doing that once is useful, but if it's actually useful, I want to do that more than once. So, you know, Let's go ahead and write, you know, that just make that a function. It's the same operation, withdraw the excess and so forth. Let's abstract it a little more. I showed you exactly in the previous slide, I showed you let's go and trade on Uniswap on Polygon. Maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want to trade somewhere else where I've got better liquidity or a better price for ETH. You know, from the point of view of redeeming my yield, I don't care. You figure it out. That's what programs, that's what software is for. Why am I having to decide particularly which of the 57 markets I could trade USDC for ETH on? That's not what I'm good at. I just want you to figure it out, right? So um, let's hit the right button. And let's figure it out. Transfer swap knows how to do a transfer and a swap and have it end up in that account. You know, and if that involves moving it over to Arbitrum to do the swap there, bring it over to base, you know, take it over to Solana and trade it on Camino, I don't care. Just, you know, make it happen. Get me the money. Get it over into that cold account. And when that's done, it's done, right? I've got ETH in that cold account and the path it got there is, 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 is completed, right? And so I'm going to want to do this every day. That's what it takes to do it every day, right? Other chains can't do that, other systems can't do that. The thing that makes this work is that fundamental ability to do these multi-block actions, right? That is what real rich use cases require, is not instantaneous transactions, but transactions for an operation that the user expressed over time so they could authorize that complex action, even if it's do something every day, right? And that requires timers, right? We've had timers since the 60s. I'm not sure why this is the only place you can get them, but it turns out it's because they have to be part of this overall async management multi-block action, right? The real world outside of a lot of crypto 
is asynchronous composition with like microservices that are all orchestrated with JavaScript in the form of Bloomberg terminals and Salesforce. And that controls trillions of dollars a day of asynchronous coordination. That's what we need in Web3 in order to be able to do the same level of rich use cases and the growing complexity that users are demanding. Okay, and then finally you've got to be able to react. So I want to be able to make something where it will unbond a position, which might take a week, and then after a week, depending on the price, go into liquid staking or sell it off and buy something else. And I can write that strategy by unbond, wait for it to be done, and then check the price asynchronously on chain, and I can do it all on chain. That's the kind of thing that we need for that next generation use cases, and that's what I referred to as sort of these impossible use cases that people need. So I mentioned some of these, right? Noble is the source of USDC in the Cosmos ecosystem. We're acceler they're accelerating the movement of USDC from ETH over into Cosmos and other places by being able to use orchestration to do an advance quickly out of an on-chain solver. Right, we've got uh, liquidity markets that are able to manage staking across multiple different chains all from one place. And et cetera, right? Okay, so those are real, re, you know, real projects that are using orchestration to extend their functionality. The key is it's something that's valuable to real projects. It's valuable to projects that have users. Every single project that has users, those users are asking for cross-chain activity. And, and on existing platforms, building that is impossible. And so we're enabling building those impossible things. So these seamless cross-chain workflows where you authorize it one time and they can now do this operation across, you know, from ETH to Solana, from Polygon to Base, or all those kinds of things, those are the things that users want and that you want to be able to enable. It gives you a level of user retention, right? If you're a service that provides some component, you're a microservice in the usual sort of sense. I've got a, uh, a, a yield farm. You saw the example of taking yield and from that go up and build a, um, an ETH position or take that yield and pay off the subscription, or take that yield and start to build up uh, um, a, 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 a lending um, uh, account uh, to be able to get more yield, secondary yield, off of your underlying staking results. All those kinds of things. If you're a service providing that, where you're providing that yield, right now what you've got to say is, here's your yield, knock yourself out. And it's up to the users to figure out what they do with it. By being able to use orchestration, they can add functionality that says, I've got things I can do with your yield. I'm offering you yield. Here's six things that I can enable for you that will compound it. You know, I can arrange for you to get the, the results into cold storage. I can arrange for you to restake those results. And here's the, here's, here are the options for restaking without having to send the customer away to a third party. Right? So being able to retain the customer and add services is a really important thing for growing businesses, as we learned in Web 2 and Web 3, still hasn't gotten there yet, right? So customer retention is really important. The improved economics, right? If, I'm, if I am one of these sources of yield, not only can I retain, this, retain the customer by saying, you know, I can take your yield and put it into that perp platform and, and let you do options on it, you can do that right here. You don't have to go to, the, to my competitor, right? Well, that now also gives me improved economics. I can offer you yield plus access to this perp functionality. I can offer you yield plus access to, you know, the market of Solana meme coins if what you want to do is spend it on meme coins, right? And then you can create new value, right? Right now it is the case that smart contracts largely, DeFi contracts largely, are pretty simple, right? There's a few hundred, there's a few that are in the thousands of lines of code, or the, the small number of thousands of lines of code. Those are still very early days in terms of what you can do, right? Being able to take yield from a, from a loan pool, build up a perp dex to hedge your loan pool in an automated fashion, and when the, when the numbers change, pull out of that hedge and go over into another one that's on a different ecosystem, that's a lot of code that no one can build right now and no one could run. Being able to do this cross-chain automation, this orchestration across these different ecosystems, lets us build those richer and more valuable use cases for users. And then finally, well, let's see. Um, and so where we're at is all of this runs, right? It is deployed, operational for all of the IBC connected ecosystems, of which there's a lot. Um, and extending out into multiple data availability layers in the worlds of Celestia and Verachain and so forth. 
and it is growing out. So we've already gotten mechanisms going all the way out into Ethereum and Solana. So the vision, what, will, what the world will be like in 2025, is you'll be able to write these orchestrations to take an existing deployed application and enhance it with functionality, the same way you can take existing applications or microservices in Web2 and be able to provide orchestration automation to be able to extend that functionality and add value to users, you'll be able to do the same thing and create these much richer cross uh, ecosystem use cases. So please uh, join me, check out, uh, you know, check out orchestration, check out what you can build and connect with uh, Agoric folks around to start adding that to the, to the project you're building now. Thank you all. And I'd like to point out my timer still says I have 20 minutes here, so you know. <laughs> that was a big fire hose, so thank you all, and I'll be around. Uh, the ne next speaker is from Stackware. Is he here? Okay. 